呃，是我们米兰的神经科医生杨好。Professor Leo Cani is a neurologist from Milan, and his research interests focused on OCT and also uh, neurological EP, and a lot of the original work has been done in China. We've been using OCT quite routinely to monitor our patients. However, for uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, it hasn't been routinely been included in our patients. So I'd like to invite Dr. Liu Kani. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and for inviting me uh, to this uh, wonderful place and uh, with this wonderful audience. Um, I also thank Prada Foundation for this opportunity. Uh, my role uh, today is to speak about uh, the possibility to use medical devices uh, to promote uh, the uh, brain plasticity and recovery. I have a, a conflict of interest in the sense that I really like uh, medical devices. I work also for, with EMA for, for this. This is the only conflict, it's cultural. Uh, and uh, I will uh, shortly uh, share with you some thoughts about the possibility to measure plasticity, to induce plasticity, and to improve plasticity. And uh, to measure, of course, histology has clearly demonstrated that uh, uh, living in an enriched environment is increasing our number of synapses, as in these uh, uh, mice, uh, hippocampus, uh, showing more synaptic buttons in uh, animals that live in a rich social environment with many stimuli. And uh, um, this is important also for enriching our lives because it's enriching our brain of connections. But in humans, we can uh, measure in many ways our brain plasticity. For example, using functional MRI, we can show that uh, uh, People who are expert in uh, skilled activity, like violin playing, uh, are using less brain resources compared with uh, people who are just learning or uh, amateur. And uh, so this is important for um, having a tool that is non-invasive, uh, showing uh, that uh, brain circuits can be reorganized uh, after learning. And, uh, but uh, this is the, the example of expert professionals. So uh, another story uh, will be to show plasticity in people who start learning something. Again, an example in uh, uh, professionals who started very early, like piano players. And an example of another method to measure brain plasticity, that is the method that we use in our lab using transcranial magnetic stimulation to um, map uh, the motor areas. So by shocking the brain, we can uh, uh, induce movements and uh, we can show and, de and depict the area of the brain that is inducing those movements uh, by measuring the muscle responses. And we can see that uh, uh, people with uh, um, no motor skill, no specific skill that are hand, uh, hand sided, uh, right hand uh, uh, dominance. Uh, and they have uh, an expansion of the map motor area in the dominant hemisphere. So they are, and we are asymmetric if we don't train the left hand, which is the non dominant, while the piano players are very symmetric. And so we are not only what we eat, but we are also what we think and what we do that is uh, shaping our brain. So we should also choose carefully what we do every day and our habits, because they also shape even our motor area. So maybe we should also train to wash our, brush our teeth with the left hand sometimes, not to atrophy, to get to lead to atrophy of the brain, uh, controlling the left. Uh, but we can induce it, so it's never too late to change uh, our brain and uh, reshape our, even our motor areas. This is an example using another technique, which is EG activity of the brain motor areas. That is um, um, 
showing uh, a lot of activation in people who are not skilled in playing the piano. So we bought a keyboard, electronic keyboard, and measured the key presses. And we saw that uh, the brain effort, so the blue area is the activation of the brain uh, shown by EG oscillations. And uh, people who practice playing the piano for two weeks every day, their effort becomes much less. So it's easier for them to control even a simple movement on the keyboard. And so this is um, induced in two weeks or so. But these were young students. So we might think that uh, it's maybe easy to measure plasticity in young people, but what about older people? Can they still learn uh, new things? Uh, we know for sure that keeping practicing can lead uh, to really keeping a uh, good performance. And so this is a real example of a 91-year-old uh, gymnast. So, but she started early in life. Uh, what about uh, starting late in life to learn something new? We know we have the basis in our brain uh, to learn something new and to develop plasticity even after 90 years old, uh, because uh, even from histology, that is not only applicable to uh, preclinical studies, but also in humans, but of course post them, we can show um, new neurons uh, forming even after 90 years old. And so that's a biological basis. And uh, there are people who are over 80, over 90, who are super um, performers in terms of memory, and even uh, super performers, and they can remember more than nine words in 10 minutes, uh, even better than uh, young, uh, normal uh, people. These uh, super performers, they have uh, higher neural densities in their memory centers, so it is possible to have a very good performance even in old age. And even to learn a new skills, as demonstrated in this experiment, where uh, it was, again, with a new method to measure plasticity, which is the thickness of the cortex, uh, that uh, even over 65-year-old uh, uh, people can learn uh, very difficult skills, like uh, this one you see in the picture. And uh, this was related to brain plasticity. but. Uh, this is the good news, but the bad news is that uh, if you stop, <laughs> you can learn in three months and have a thicker cortex, but if you stop for three more months, then you go back uh, as you were. So plasticity is also reversible. So it's not enough to learn something, but also to keep doing it. And uh, so it's a two directional uh, plasticity. So we could do something to have it last longer or have it uh, occurring uh, faster or stronger. And one way could be, of course, uh, with uh, pharmacological interventions, but also with uh, physical interventions like uh, rehabilitation or neuromodulation. And I would focus on the non-invasive neuromodulation because everyone can use it, even in healthy conditions. And um, the major tools are transcranial direct current stimulation, which is not painful, a way to deliver very low intensity currents in the brain. And we can also choose the area that we want to uh, stimulate more. And there is another method that is also non-invasive, although it looks more maybe scary, but it's really not painful, uh, with magnetic fields applied again with the mobile uh, coil in different parts of the brain. And uh, the first... Um, the first tool, the electric current that is also portable so people can take it at home and do some uh, home-based interventions, can increase the excitability of the motor cortex uh, in a single session after 20 minutes of current delivery of the, over the motor cortex. You can increase the excitability as from the responses to magnetic simulation. The muscle responses become uh, larger, so the brain is more excitable on the motor cortex that is being stimulated. And if you deliver not anodal currents, but cathodal, you can even inhibit. So you can induce plasticity to enhance some uh, learning or maybe to decrease uh, hyperexcitability. Think about epilepsy where the brain is too active, so you want to put it down. So you can have a bidirectional uh, intervention but applications in many neurodegenerative diseases, including even depression, are not so satisfying so far. This is a result of a meta-analysis where the um, 
the diamond uh, on the um, right uh, would favor the intervention and the diamond on the left would favor um, uh, the um, appearance simulation, like a fake simulation. And um, by combining studies, there is not a big uh, effect uh, favoring the active intervention. But it could be that the studies were using a too short uh, time uh, or maybe too low energies to the brain. So maybe a more promising uh, tool could be the other tool that I told you, the magnetic simulation that is inducing stronger fields in the brain. And it's already approved uh, for in the US, for example, in uh, drug resistant depression since uh, a few years now, uh, with different devices, uh, different methods of simulation. And uh, also, there is a portable device uh, uh, approved in the US uh, with uh, uh, extinction of migraine attacks during the aura uh, symptoms. And also there is a device for obsessive compulsive disorder that, and these are all reimbursed in the US. So, so I would like to know the situation in China, of course, during the discussion. And um, uh, analysis combining many studies have shown more promising results using the magnetic stimulation, but we could do better for example, uh, we could uh, think of a stimulation that in neurodegenerative diseases would target many areas, not only one area like the motor area or the um, frontal area that was the target of most studies. And um, so for, with this purpose, at NIH, uh, uh, there was uh, the development and that of a tool that is also patented in the US that is the H coil that is uh, designed to stimulate not only one part of the brain, one specific small region like two centimeters with the traditional instruments that are approved in the US uh, that I showed you about before, but also targeting uh, maybe bilateral areas or a wide network, uh, which is the case for most neurodegenerative diseases. We apply one of these to target the Broca area, the language area in a patient with the difficulties in producing speech. And we demonstrated that we could improve the metabolism with PET on the language area, the Broca area, after a month of treatment. So it's not like five days with TDCS, it took a month. And uh, we uh, could also show that he could improve his speech. And we also went on with a bilateral device uh, allowing to stimulate a larger motor network in the frontal and motor areas to improve the symptoms in Par Parkinson's disease. And uh, this is the real stimulation um, going up. Uh, the values going up means, mean improvement, and the improvement is much larger and significantly larger compared with the of apparent uh, stimulation, which is uh, only placing the, the coil on the head, delivering some noise, but with no real energy on the brain. But you can see that there is a, a bit of placebo effect that we always have to measure when we design a trial in uh, um, disorders like uh, Parkinson's disease, where the motor activity can improve also because of a placebo effect. But for tremor, uh, that was motor skills, but with tremor, we did not see um, a big placebo effect. So what we find in the effect of tremor, I, we can believe uh, much better. And uh, this is uh, to show you an example of a patient before and after the stimulation. If I can, okay. I know. Uh, I have to go, okay, one and two. So. Okay, the second one is still the same person. He started later because I clicked the button later, but he's faster, so he's already going back. So this is after the simulation. Uh, we did a similar experiment, a study with uh, Alzheimer's disease. Of course, now it's not motor task, but uh, cognitive performance, and we found after four weeks of treatment, so again, a full month of treatment, that there was an improvement. Here, the improvement is going down that was significantly better than people who only received the appearance stimulation. But uh, again, plasticity is reversible after two more months, uh, after um, one more month, uh, the situation went back. 
similarity to people who had the, uh, only the appearance simulation. So again, we need to continue and practice, but maybe there was uh, another issue that in this case, we did not couple the stimulation with training, with the, something that is inducing our plasticity to improve. So it's not enough to stimulate the brain. We have to give it a direction on improving. So we can stimulate in a, a specific way, but uh, it's better to give together the stimulation and the training towards the direction that we want. An example is uh, in people with a stroke, uh, we performed a brain stimulation on the leg area and we improved uh, three patients out of 10 uh, only by stimulating, but if we couple the stimulation with activity on the legs, like cycling during the stimulation, we could double the effect. So really the key is not to stimulate and stay there waiting for something to happen, but to work towards improving ourselves. And we did a similar study uh, for three weeks uh, combining uh, uh, intensive rehabilitation and brain stimulation on the leg area in people undergoing um, intensive rehabilitation in, the, in our department and people with multiple sclerosis. This was a pilot study on 23 uh, people. And we showed improvement in walking speed, the time needed to walk 10 minutes, or the number of meters to, uh, that people can walk in six minutes, or the spasticity, and uh, that was very promising. So we re repeated the study in people, in 100 people with a mass uh, that was, uh, um, that was uh, just uh, finished last year, during the, the still the, the the tail of the pandemic, and we showed that people who were undergoing rehabilitation but also had received the active stimulation, they kept going well even after they stopped the treatment. So this is the period of treatment, and this is the period when they were at home, they kept improving because they kept moving, while people who only received the rehabilitation and not the stimulation, they went back as before, the stimulation in uh, uh, just a few weeks, and so it's important uh, to keep moving, but it's also um, important to add something to keep the fact of what we do. Uh, and the brain simulation could be some, that something. That's uh, what, an example of a person with multiple sclerosis who underwent uh, the rehabilitation plus uh, the brain stimulation. Uh, and uh, we can see after a while that um, um, the speed will uh, be shown to be f higher and faster after the, the training and simulation. And he had undergone many uh, uh, sessions of, of uh, rehabilitation over the years with not, without such an effect. So we're quite uh, optimistic about the possibility to continue. But uh, we should also think that people need uh, to train at home, so we have to find methods to allow people to not only to move, but also to get the stimulation at home or in a specific setting. So I will show you the example of a piano player who had uh, two lesions on the motor uh, cortical, uh, corticospinal tract for the two hands, and uh, she trained in our uh, institute uh, by playing the piano and also receiving the simulation. And uh, I would like to show you how we did because uh, the TDCS is portable, but brain stimulation is not. So you can combine. So she's playing. This is the simulation. I can grant you it's real, but in the case of a placebo simulation, people only receive the noise. Then there is the beep saying stop playing so that can receive the simulation and play again. Uh, but you can see that after uh, three weeks of treatment, she can now play again. We don't have the baseline before she started the training because she, did, she was a professional player. She didn't want to get the video because she was really, really slow. But you can see also by the time to move uh, the nine pegs on the, the, the key, uh, that uh, the time needed uh, before and after the, the training was really improving from one minute to, to move one, nine pegs on the, on the desk uh, to like uh, 20, 25 seconds. So it's really a big improvement. Um, but uh, maybe we should uh, also uh, not only personalize treatment, but also uh, find the good people that could 
better respond to this combination. And I believe it would be people that have some spared corticospinal or networking, uh, brain network uh, to work on. And for example, even in other studies performed by other groups, like here in uh, mild Alzheimer's disease or in mild cognitive impairment that was even before the appearance of a, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, there is uh, an effect on cognition that is um, not only after treatment, but also a few weeks or months after treatment. So I believe uh, that uh, um, we can have more enduring results if we target people with less advanced uh, disease. And uh, to go back to our people with multiple sclerosis, uh, we also found that people with multiple sclerosis that could still have some re motor responses to the lower limbs after magnetic stimulation are the ones who respond best, who become faster in walking after three weeks of treatment with brain stimulation and rehab, while people who had exhausted corticospinal reserve, uh, so they had absent motor responses to the legs when stimulated to the brain, they responded very poorly, uh, similarly to people who only received the uh, appearance simulation, the, the sham simulation. And plasticity reserve is also important because um, in Alzheimer's disease, uh, we can see that uh, the normal increase in the muscle responses that we have to fast, uh, high-frequency stimulation at the five hertz, this is the muscle response at one stimulus, and after we repeat the stimuli, you see it's becoming larger, and that's the measure of plasticity. And in Alzheimer's disease, this is uh, not always so evident, like in this extreme case where you see no change. And it seems that this no change is uh, uh, more evident in people with higher markers of uh, brain damage, like uh, tau protein accumulation in the brain that in this case, we're measured in the cerebrospinal fluid. So we have a lot to do uh, in uh, also finding uh, the right people to, to respond and uh, also in uh, helping people to perform uh, uh, rehabilitation also at home. And uh, I think uh, digital uh, methods will help to combine brain stimulation with the computerized cognitive training and uh, that we could uh, also find uh, the right time uh, to start uh, the intervention by maybe also monitoring people at home. In uh, People with MS, uh, I have the honor of coordinating the digital uh, group in the PROMS, uh, the uh, Patient Reported Outcomes in MS, uh, which is an international initiative, and we are collecting uh, the, um, what is uh, available in the world uh, as digital tools to monitor people with MS. Uh, Professor Comey already showed you that it is possible to measure uh, the number of steps, for example. And when uh, in the COVID hit Italy, we, we had a big cohort of the patients that Professor Comey told you about uh, that were monitored with uh, wrist, uh, wrist watch to measure the number of steps. And we saw them going down even on the day when we learned that we had the first patient in Italy. And uh, so it is important because uh, um, the number of steps can decrease not only because of uh, disease worsening, but also because of environmental factors like uh, the lockdowns. And uh, in, for example, in Italy, we were not allowed to go to parks. And so the number of steps in Italy went really down in our patients, but in Denmark, people were allowed to go to parks. These are from Google uh, um, Maps, uh, so the, in Italy, uh, and Google Maps in Denmark. People w went to parks and they did walk a lot. And so the number of steps in people with a mass in Denmark did not go down. So we need, uh, I think, artificial intelligence to combine all data, including environmental data and uh, also um, legal restrictions to, to understand why people are walking more or less. It's not the only because of a disease. And in Italy also the rehabilitation services were closed totally. So their activity went down. 
So I think uh, it's important not only to target uh, neurodegenerative diseases but, and uh, brain uh, dysfunction when we see it, but also when we don't see it, as we saw also before. So we know that people going to work in the space uh, train a lot to build their muscles before they go. There is a program. Uh, for that in the NASA, uh, or building muscles before going to space, and I think we should build our brain before uh, living our lives uh, and to have a good uh, aging process. And so I would like to thank all, my, all the people I work with and you for your attention. Thank you so much. So as a moderator, I have the advantage of ask first question, forgive me. Uh, so in terms of responder who are most likely benefit from this approach, mm -hmm. I think uh, in stroke patients once with a, uh, uh, during the recovery, recovery phase, there's no continuous uh, detrimental uh, effects like those in MS and in uh, PD or AD, uh, they probably will be the most uh, people who are most less benefit from this approach. Do you, do, do you agree? And yes, I thank you for this important comment. I think mm. it's uh, very important mm. to um, um, have a good profiling of uh, mm. the, this individual uh, subject to best target their intervention and also to identify even in the same disease, which are the single functions that are more affected in that person? Because think about MS or Parkinson's disease. Uh, some people have more uh, axial problems, leg problems or hand problems, cognitive, language. So uh, the disease is uh, affecting the brain in a very complex manner. And so even not only the stage, but also the specific location could be also approached in a specific manner. All right, all right. So the phase two and three trial in MS, and uh, do you consider select uh, relatively homogeneous patients so that they affect brain in a similar region? In, in doing so, you may be able to reduce the number of subjects to see the uh, uh, outcome measures. I mean, I know the paper is not published. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, thank you for this point. Uh, is uh, the adequate profiling and selectivity mm. of uh, inclusion criteria can really reduce the number of patients. Mm. But I have to say, in order to really mm. show improvements, I selected people who already have evident, very evident mm. slowing of speed, of walking speed, for example. Mm. And so my, myself, I also targeted people in a quite later stage mm. of the disease. Mm -hmm. to be able to show an effect. But I think the way to go is to anticipate even when the, if the clinical evidence is not yet there. Mm -hmm. In a way, like uh, Professor Cohen was saying, to treat uh, the prodromal phase of mm -hmm. the disease, we should also target the prodromal phase of a symptom. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's certain that after your talk, we should do this in our patients uh, because anti-lingo therapy failed. We don't have any single repair therapy and, and this is very stimulating but so questions for the uh, from the audiences yeah. any questions the floor is opened the um, mechanism behind this uh, brain function enhancement uh, after the magnetic stimulation mm -hmm. thank you there are several mechanisms some are short uh, um, like uh, appear early, like increase in brain excitability, and you can see it even in seconds, like the increase in the responses to magnetic stimulation on the muscle. You can see it like after uh, 10 stimuli. And uh, there are other longer terms that also refer to the, um, what is uh, the field that you like, like epigenetic mechanisms, because uh, it has been shown, but of course only in preclinical studies, in mice that uh, also the transcription, the DNA transcription can be modulated, but towards the production of factors that promote brain plasticity, like the brain-derived neurotrophic factor that is the mostly studied factor that is in increased by high-frequency stimulation. So 
That's why we should also do some training and motor training or cognitive training because BDNF, the brain derived neurotrophic factor, is improving the, the formation of new synapses. But to form new synapses, you need to make an effort to do something. It's not enough to produce the BDNF to have a new synapse. You also have the synapse to work. Are there specific uh, receptors or channels responding to the oh. magnetic fields? Oh, yes. Uh, there has been, uh, uh, and there is still ongoing research uh, on uh, the effects on uh, not only glutamatergic receptors, but also GABAergic receptors. So that is uh, quite, uh, there is uh, quite a strong evidence on, on that. What if we just place ourselves in a magnetic field? Uh, can we learn everything faster? Uh, actually, if we, there are studies, um, thank you for this provocative uh, question. There are studies on uh, static magnetic fields, like putting a magnet on your head. <laughs> that can really reduce uh, the brain excitability and it has been used, uh, and there are trials on that, to reduce uh, the excitability in um, ALS for in uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, but that's still uh, localized on the motor cortex. Mm. Data on uh, you know environmental fields are not available with this respect, but um, it's the change of the field. It's not a static field that we study because it's pulses of a hundred microseconds, so less than uh, one millisecond. I want I think that we'd rather put the kids underneath a uh, magnetic uh, uh, iron, then they will get smarter. We'd rather send them for the treatment, not to go to the schools. For me, I'm a neurologist, for, especially for movement disorders. So I can say the good the expression of the Parkinson disease. But here, Maybe how about your experience for mood disorder or depression? For have you any experience or good? Oh, thank you. Um, uh, not personally, but there is a lot of literature because now it's routine for a psychiatrist to treat depression using uh, brain stimulation, especially in people who did not respond to a first uh, drug. Uh, but I think there are also promising uh, applications for with this respect, think about uh, the possibility to uh, treat uh, postpartum depression where you don't want to have the antidepressant drugs to be in the breast milk uh, and to be affecting the, the baby. Uh, using brain stimulation, you can leave no nothing in the blood. But of course, this could be used also for other applications. Think about sports. And that could become a doping because there, there is no evident uh, change in the blood uh, chemicals. So that could be also a way to improve uh, performance in healthy people with some ethical consequences that we should discuss. Uh, lady first. Lady first. <laughs> uh, Hi, my name is Anja. I'm from NGO. I'm responsible person for an NGO in Shanghai. We have established this NGO, and the purpose of uh, establishing this NGO is to uh, influence more people and also to improve people's awareness of brain health. So we've been doing um, the education for brain health for around ten years, and uh, in Shanghai, starting from 2019, we have. Uh, I started the um, project of uh, cognitive disorder community project, and right now we are doing the fourth and fifth wave of this project. Right now, I am more focused on at home uh, treatment intervention. So, for some of the elderly patients, we wanted to evaluate their brain health and then intervene after evaluation. But we have noticed that a lot of family members will question our 
evaluation, they always ask, "How can you prove your intervention works?" Because we usually use non-medicational interventions. So the biggest challenge for us is being challenged, being questioned. So doing cognitive training. And that you have mentioned, we've been trying some of the similar approaches, but it's very difficult to demonstrate the efficacy. So a lot of family members they don't、uh, they don't buy that, they don't accept the service we provide. So for a lot of the eighty elderly patients, they only come to us when they are very advanced. So basically, if they are very advanced eighty patients, there's nothing much we can do. So from your professional perspective,、uh, what kind of guidance you can provide for us so that we can better demonstrate the efficacy of at-home rehabilitation? It's a very important、uh, question.、Uh, I think.、Uh, There are two aspects. One is that we can、uh, show them the literature on、uh, longitudinal、um, data, taking years and years.、Uh, there are cohorts of people studied for like 20, 30 years,、uh, um, and uh, uh, it was demonstrated that people with more social connections are more resistant to develop、uh, Alzheimer's disease and even to develop brain atrophy. So we can、uh, explain this、uh, complex literature in a simple way, so that、uh, elderly people can understand and buy that, as, as you say. But、uh, also, we can demonstrate that the people are improving、uh, significantly in short period with very intensive, which is not what we would like to do in elderly people, but in people with some.、Uh, Uh, already evident deficits. We, there are already many data demonstrated that intensive cognitive rehabilitation can improve, and you can show them that if they stop, when they stop training, they go back down. So even if they don't buy that,、uh, continuous habits can improve and keep the brain working. You can show artificial experiments. Where people are training for two months, they improve significantly, and that's statistics. They should accept that. But if that if things are not becoming a habit, things are going to be lost. So they must keep doing the work if you, they want to keep their brain doing well. And so we can make it in a simple way. We can. I would like also to work together with you to find the, the specific literature to explain. To, pay, to elderly people, that the science is already there. If I, I can, if I can jump a bit in this discussion, because this is the area where、uh, human brains, perhaps the foundation, is now moving.、Uh, <coughs> the international committee、um, is convinced that、uh, we should start to educate people since the high school or the elementary school. How to protect the brain? Because、uh, it is incredible how poor is the education from this point of view. We don't respect our brain. We,、um, in, in most of the cases, we really damage、uh, our brain for very simple、uh, motivation.、Uh, and if we can create such an education, this really at, at the school level, so that people knows that the brain is. Not something magic is、uh, something that、uh, has to be handled with caution and、um, and to be protected because、uh, you can gain we estimated ten years of life of good life if you have such an education. So it's incredible how much we invest in terms of、uh, money to、uh, to have maybe only six months more of life, and then we don't invest to have. The quality of life, because it's not enough to live longer. It is important to live longer and to enjoy <laughs> for living longer. So, I think we should really have some very international, global effort,、uh, and and the brain health、uh, initiative that is already now moving everywhere internationally,、uh, in collaboration with the Prada,、uh, will move in this direction. So, so for your、um, patient or their family members, whether they can really、uh, accept that, and for Professor Liu Kang's report,、uh, actually she has shared with us a lot of data already in her talk, and to make it 
accessible in her setting for mm -hmm. community care? We, we, I mean, is anybody considering that? Yes, it's very important to really reach uh, the people to to explain what we make sometimes complicated. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, it was very impressive to see that uh, uh, you have actually profound uh, uh, achievement in uh, uh, in terms of the RTMS application. Uh, for example, patient with MS. I'm just wondering uh, two quick questions. Uh, one is. Uh, I see the most uh, direct uh, measurement is on the, for example, the walking speed of the patient. Any other uh, physiological uh, biomarkers can be linked uh, with 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 improvement, bring uh, function improvement. For example, uh, brain volume loss. So I'm not expert. Uh, for example, the serum NFL. Any uh, indicator on those uh, more biological biomarkers? Uh, that's the first question. And the other one is. Any adverse uh, effect from the uh, current research? For example, uh, I heard that there is a reported uh, cases for uh, that the RTMS will, will cause uh, epilepsy. Mm. So I'm not sure whether um, in the in the longer run, do you think um, consider the the the, the uh, as we just discussed? Because uh, some pe some patients obviously they respond better outcomes uh, linked with uh, RTMS use and some maybe less, and uh, maybe in the long run we can, uh, a bit like the personalized uh, DMTs, consider the uh, 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 benefit risk profile of the, of the pa patient, how, respond, how they respond to the, to the, to the RTMS uh, technologies. Mm -hmm. Just two quick uh, uh, thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are both important questions. Concerning the first, you actually said what we are doing now. So we are collecting neurofilaments, uh, neuroimaging, and also kinematic uh, features of walking uh, in our people, in our neuro rehabilitation department, uh, directed by Professor Comey. And uh, because we're now, after these uh, good results, we are applying this uh, with no placebo. We are offering because people want to, to receive the real simulation. And so these are the measures we are collecting. And concerning uh, the, the second, uh, uh, or the RTMS is already around since 2008 for depression. And uh, as uh, with the previous question, there is a lot of experience on depression. And there were side effects that were epileptic seizures, mm -hmm. but people who had epileptic seizures are already quite a few. And uh, following these people, nobody developed epilepsy. So that could be a seizure as a side effect, but uh, is not inducing epilepsy as a disease. So nobody became sick. I see. Which thank, is good. Thank you, thank you very so much. I, I can instantly think about if we do this, we should incorporate functional MRI, PSG, and uh, we do have 70 MRI. For research only, uh, DTI will be very good in monitoring the uh, the uh, track, sweat matter connection and the networking. So probably that will provide more mechanistic insight into how it works. Yes, it's important. Also, the thickness of the cortex. We should measure it before and after the intervention because mm -hmm. that was demonstrated already to increase. So thank you. So I think we have to uh, let Professor Comey close the morning session because we're running late, kind of. No, in fact, it's time to close. I think uh, we had a quite uh, rich uh, morning. Uh, I think it was, uh, I think, uh, uh, quite well, uh, let's say, discussed. And uh, we need now to, after a lot of food for the mind, some food for the stomach. So. Uh, be back as uh, planned at 2 o'clock, okay?